So this already concludes our first round, and I think we can already see that uh, the memory of 1989 is very diverse. And um, the question really is, uh, how can we connect to this one thing, uh, to this one event in time? And um, is there something European about it being so different also for different people in different uh, places? But let's back up a little bit and um, maybe start at the beginning. Uh, how did we get to 1989? And I would like to um, ask Mr. Beichelt um, if you could um, maybe recollect for us some of the uh, factors that led up to the 1989 democratic transitions and peaceful revolution and um, how German reunification then enabled also EU enlargement. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think it's more recollecting things um, we all know. Yeah, I don't have I don't have an own let's say theory of what made these events happen. Uh, one, so I just collect some some factors. Uh, one of them is certainly uh, political changes in the Soviet Union, with Mikhail Gorbachev not really knowing what to do with uh, you know with western and central europe and also losing control of the process it was not really steered it was more like event one event came after the other but uh, certainly giving up the brezhnev doctrine um, and giving signals that the red army would not would not uh, oppose to um, societal changes and political changes in in uh, satellite states was one element Another element was probably the, um, uh, how to say, within Germany, the Stasi uh, had a quite violent reputation, you know, but um, also the people from the East German elites, political elites, security elites, somehow seem to have been impressed by the way, by the peaceful way. Um, things had developed notably in Poland and in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And somehow there was this idea, not very outspoken, but uh, should uh, SED and Stasi side with uh, Chinese forces in Tian Tiananmen pl uh, place, uh, a square, in, uh, uh, this was 1989, in June. So should Stasi cho choose, so to say, the Asian way, or should it, should it choose a Central European way? And that was quite an important element, I think. <coughs> so having this, this example of, of uh, the Tiananmen Square actually played uh, in, into the hands of those who said that a, a peaceful transfer should be, uh, should be uh, shared. I don't know, I mean, Knowing the literature on these East uh, or Central European thoughts with Havel, which, uh, to whom you referred, and also um, in Poland, of course, and in other places in Hungary, is it exaggerated or not? I mean, it's very, it's very important to scholars and it's very important to people who work a lot with texts, but I'm not so convinced. Do really many, many East Germans uh, read Polish or understand processes in, in, uh, in, in, in Czech? I mean, Havel was translated, but all, I mean, they, he, he, he worked in his own language, right? And his, he was a theater guy. I, I don't think that many, many East Germans actually knew about it. So um, I have the feeling that then it's also internal processes within the uh, GDR. Um, uh, the Christian element, uh, a lot of these prayers and churches. I mean, all had, you know, there was not, very important was that there was not this one step when somebody or some event would lead to violence, but it all, it all stayed below this threshold. Yeah, I think that this is not only factors who, which impact, but I also tried to put up some, some factors which, which characterize uh, what came later, namely peacefulness. Yeah, peaceful revolution is in a way a contradiction in itself, but it happened in many, in many places um, uh, around uh, in, in Europe, from Moscow to East Berlin, and so it fell in line in a way. Would you say that um, <coughs> that the reunification process then was already foreseen in November of 1989? I don't think so. <coughs> I remember March uh, 18, uh, 1990. That was the time when the when the first elections within the GDR uh, occurred, 
And a lot of people were expecting that the GDR would continue. And there was actually a big surprise that forces from the Christian Democratic side won these elections. Um, it was not predictable in a way. So uh, after, after March, uh, I think it was March 18, uh, after that time, the road was for a reunification. Before, it was more about a solution which could be within one state or within two states, um, but which would you know, um, allow for traveling, would, which would allow for uh, peaceful cooperation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so with your reunification then, um, not only the, the state changed or economic state ch um, changed, but also society changed a lot. And the transformation had impacts on, on, on society. And I would like to ask uh, Judith Enders if you could um, yeah, tell us something about what were the societal changes, transformations that impacted uh, the society of uh, of uh, the 90s, basically in Germany, and uh, maybe then come also to to who this generation, a uh, third generation East, uh, who is that? Uh, yeah, please. Yes, uh, yes. Maybe I start with it. Who is the third generation East, and what was the reason to? Uh, make up this phrase or this idea of of this group, and it was in the um, in 2009 or 10 as the uh, 20th anniversary of the um, unification came up, and uh, we as uh, youngsters in the end of 20s we watched uh, television again <laughs> and thought, oh God, there are f four old men are sitting there, Mr. Tierse from the east and three old men from the West, and they're talking about what happened in the former GDR and what happened in the transformation process. And there was no female voice and there was no young voice. And we ask ourselves, okay, what is our experience? Uh, the people who have been young or who have been children in the in the 80s and in have um, experiences uh, from 1989, what was the view of, of a child or of a young man, person? And uh, so we said, okay, this voice should be heard. And uh, it's important to, um, to see that the different generations, as the grandparents, the parents and the youngest, have different uh, experiences of what happened to uh, in this 20 or 30 years of uh, transformation now. And this experiences in the former GDR and as well in the European countries around us who have been this change too in the East, Europe East European countries have been uh, life-changing and uh, but for every generation in a different way and so we came up to uh, say okay we will uh, view the world our view as the youngest generation and on the other hand we want to have a dialogue with our parents and grandparents and not to forget uh, that the experience of the uh, second world war was in the mind of the oldest of the grandparents and uh, transferred to the parents and to our generation as well. And the experience of two dictatorships are important and it is something what you need but you need to work out. You cannot just leave it behind you. You have to work with it. And we wanted to work with this in a constructive way. And so we um, founded our association Perspektive Hoch 3. That means Eastern perspective, Western perspective, European perspective. And so we try to to bring together the old generation, the parents' generation, and our generation experiences together. And the key for us is a dialogue, to find the personal dialogue, because every story is another story we heard in this round here, that everybody has to uh, talk another story, but uh, something is similar and something's different, and that's the cheeky point on it. Mm -hmm. And um, so after a phase of self-assurance, is it a construction, third generation East, also people who have been born between 1975 and 1985, or is there something in common, or is this just an idea what we had? We have been eight persons who came up with this idea, and uh, but we decided to figure out, and there was a big, uh, a very, very big resonance of the society, and so 
we uh, tend uh, tended to to make uh, cultural actions on that, bringing this idea and discussions and this idea of dialogue to the rural areas where you have the contradictions and the questions with the right wing thinking persons and their reasons why they have so big aggressions and uh, to to go to the uh, European context and uh, we made this project called Mapping a Generation uh, in, in Europe but because ev or we are maybe the same generation but we have different uh, experience but I felt what you could feel about Václav Havel because I can really see what you mean and uh, I think that's the same why we do social, social cultural projects on photography, film, um, books, whatever to to explain ourselves and the others <laughs> what happened in 30 years of transformation. Because the, the main thing is the cognitive thing is the one hand, but the thing by the heart that's the other hand. And that will be got lost for the next generation if we don't work it out, so you can, will never feel it. But if you work on it, you can feel it too as a young person. And do you think that um, uh, that the voices of, of people that were young during, um, after um, reunification, um, are they heard enough in, in, in debates today? I would say never enough, but good enough, I would say. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the interesting thing is uh, the dialogue. And um, what what comes up when you, when you explain your position and when you hear what the others explain, and it is changing during times because all memories are changing over the years. And uh, it's a kind of... Um, so this dialogue can come up with some new ideas of the future. That's the important thing. If you want to have a, a, or to provoke a good European future, you have to uh, look at the uh, at the past and develop together, maybe out of your experiences, uh, good ideas for um, for the future. What we will have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe. Speaking of, of, of dialogue and also exchanging with other Central European countries, Istvan. Um, the Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian um, historical moments and also your path to democratic transition was a little bit different um, than in Germany, but they also connected at certain points. You already uh, pointed that out. Maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on how they, how they connected and maybe how that is useful today. Well, it's uh, certainly very much connected. Uh, what happened in Hungary had an influence on the German development, uh, as I tried to say, and the other way around, whenever it became more and more evident that an East German communist state cannot survive, even if it becomes more and more democratic on its own, but there will be a unification process. It was a sort of feeling of uh, historic changes and a sort of victory for, for opposition people that the communist bloc as such has uh, actually has collapsed uh, at by the end of uh, 1989 and there is a rivalry between uh, the Poles and the Hungarians who were first I think the Poles were first and we followed them but then we became a little bit more radical when during the round table discussions uh, we in the opposition argued for a totally free election and not a partially free election and and uh, what was mentioned, the massacre in, in China also influenced us, so there was also another opportunity that uh, the democratic transition, the peaceful or lawful transition can also lead to disaster. And in Hungary, there was another strong argument that we should avoid any sort of bloodshed and a terrible catastrophe, and that was the the memory of 1956, the our revolution against the Soviet-type Stalinist regime back in the 50s. And that was a heroic find. And uh, in 1989, there was a new uh, work on, a new, on, on the memory of politics since during the soft, sort of soft, soft dictatorship under the Kalda regime tried to oppress the memory of our uprising and there was a, a general amnesia in the population and the opposition brought back the fantastic story and example of the revolution but without the bloody part of it but instead of a bloody and uh, then then oppressed revolution we wanted to have a, a peaceful negotiated uh, uh, transition where even 
the reform-minded communists, reform communists, played a role. And that's another important issue, even today, who, who to thank for the transition, uh, whether the reform communists played a more important role or whether the people, including a lot of intellectuals, played a more important role when we finally succeeded in a democratic political regime. And to make the picture even more complicated, compared to the Czech Republic or or Poland, today the general mood is is much more pessimistic regarding uh, what happened 30 years ago. A lot of people think that there was no real regime change at all. Only elites have been changed. Others think that it was not important. We have so many problems that they don't really believe in, in a democratic society anymore. And I think what we have today, a sort of populist, illiberal regime, not like in Germany, unfortunately, where you have a strong democratic uh, basis, both on, especially on the western side of Germany, but even in, in a united Germany, I would say, altogether. In Hungary, there is a much deeper problem. And because of this disillusionment and a sort of rhetoric that during the last 30 years, things have developed in not a very good direction in the eyes of many people. The, the memories of 1989 have been not so wonderful as they should. I still strongly believe that what happened to us or what some of us even participated in, these were fantastic years as it was showed in the movie just a couple of minutes ago and uh, it should be remembered as the best period of Hungary and the region which led to German reunification and later on the big enlargement of the European Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we may, might come back to this point of uh, the disillusionment aspects uh, of the memory uh, of towards uh, 1989. Um, first, maybe another perspective uh, from, from another neighboring country, Czech Republic, uh, Peter Just, um, maybe want to, to contribute also to. Uh, it was interesting to listen to uh, Istvan saying who inspired whom. Actually, I represent a country who was one of the last ones to uh, enter the path towards democratization. Uh, I hope I recollected uh, the Timothy Garten Ash, uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, metaphor correctly, that it took nine years in Poland, nine months in Hungary, nine weeks in Eastern Germany, and nine days in Czechoslovakia, which already says that we were one of the last ones who, who uh, entered the path to democratization, which I agree also means that the, the later you begin, the more radical probably you have to be. Uh, so then it took a speed, uh, quite quite fast speed, and it concluded within really the nine days between November 17th, 1989, and the uh, Revolution Velvet Revolution, which was mentioned in the movie, and the 25th and 26th November on the extraordinary session of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, where the party presidium, de facto, the most powerful institution in the entire state, more powerful than the president, more powerful than the parliament, they resigned. So that was the main symbol, like you were talking about these press conferences of the uh, German, East German government as something like a symbolic moment when people somehow said, it's over, or felt it's over. In our case, it was actually a, not a press conference, but a decision of the, of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, presidium of the Central Committee, that they are actually giving up a week after, week and few days after, uh, after the, su uh, the suppression of the protest in, uh, on the National Avenue in, in Prague. So within these nine days, uh, we pretty much turned all the events uh, towards the democratization but on the other hand, um, the question remains whether we are already fully democratized and stabilized. Uh, we entered 
some stage of democratization processes that were caused by many factors. Many of them were already mentioned here, the Gorbachev policy, uh, the events in other countries which influenced the opposition in our country, which influenced the people, the, the gray masses of people who tried to stay away from both politics, the active pro-regime politics, but also stay away from this anti-regime opposition because they were afraid of all, all these uh, suppressions that may come. Uh, so these were the signals in, that came from other countries, Poland, Hungary, uh, the semi-free elections in Poland in June 1989 already. Uh, you have these, uh, these uh, triangular discussions or roundtable discussions in, in Hungary. Uh, Hungarian and Polish parliaments voting uh, for declarations uh, when they actually apologized for 1968 intervention to Czechoslovakia, still in the middle of 1989, in the year that our Communist Party, well, I don't know if, if it still had full power, but definitely pretended to have still full power over Czechoslovakia, which was kind of shock for them. So all these were factors that led to, and in a certain moment, under certain uh, like coincidences, to the fall uh, of the regime. But the fall is one thing, and then what comes next? There comes some political transition, some political consolidation. There comes some economic consolidation, but there comes societal consolidation as well. And this is where there, is, there was the question mark I was, uh, I was placing in, in one of the questions before, and this is probably what also we would be probably discussing more, more further whether the society is already fully adapted to uh, a new conditions, new regimes. You, cannot, you can change by law the political system. You can pass new constitution in parliament. You can pass by law the economic reforms, but you cannot pass a law which tells people how they should think. And we will probably still witness uh, that the generations that lived under the communism, that were deeply influenced by it, even subconscious, subconsciously, they did not realize that they are so much influenced. And they still are, and these are, let's say, reasons for Czech Euroscepticism, that there still are factors which influence people's thinking, some forces from outside trying, us to, uh, trying to tell us what we should do. This is one of the reasons when we talk about the, let's say, critical attitude of Czechs towards uh, European Union, because there are some recollections and remindings of Munich 1938 and, uh, and intervention in 1968. And I could go on to the histo these deeper historical, historical features. Uh, and it still shows how uh, people's uh, like interiors are very much vulnerable to um, jump for uh, some uh, historical grievances to fall in, under, the, uh, under the influence of historical grievances. And uh, these historical grievances are now reflected in, in many of current uh, like contemporary events, such as the uh, European integration and access and the approach and perception uh, to the Europe. So this is task for decades to come uh, still to consolidate democracy also as a way how people think and act. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, also this is uh, the question, how can, can the remembrance of the events in 98 also help us still to continue this uh, consolidation of democratic values and that didn't necessarily coincide uh, the societal transformation at the same speed than, than other transformations did is uh, maybe something that we can discuss. But first I would uh, like to also include um, Marie Kepler in, in the discussion um, because I still think there is uh, a lot of effects of uh, reunification and of EU enlargement that are felt by especially younger generations today. And I think you mentioned, uh, you outlined those in your, in your essay very uh, nicely, and I would like to, uh, to ask you to do that for us uh, as well. So what are the effects um, of the events that you didn't you know, knowingly witness, but what are the effects that you can still feel uh, today? Um, well, I think it's important that you pointed out that we don't know about this when we are born because we, uh, we don't grow up in a regime where we feel those changes, so we only learn about them through our education. 
And we have to do that first to sort of get a feel for the time and get a feel for the identity. So we take it very much for granted that Europe is united and Germany is united. Um, I still don't know whether that's like a blessing or a curse, but I guess that's um, yeah what we find out through education. Um, but when it comes to blessing, I think it's definitely like the unification of families that um, yeah made a lot of lives, like improved a lot of lives, that um, made a lot of people happy, um, and even like brought new people into existence. Like I have friends that one parent is from the east of Germany and one is from the west, so those people would not have been possible without it. Um, but then it also, I think what's really important is that um, we grew up in peace. Um, that was the end of the Cold War, so we did not have to fear about like nuclear armament, uh, any sort of those fears, we never had them. Um, and I think that's really important to realize that um, because of that, we had a lot of more time we could use or thought time and we can still do that to other issues and I think that's it's a really fortunate position to be in. Um, but then on the other hand it's also negative aspects. So you talked about the third generation East, I think there's a fourth one definitely and as you talked about the decades um, and how long it will take to sort of change the minds. Um, those people in the East that grow up there now they don't um, they don't have like an Eastern identity, they don't have like a oh, I live in East Germany, um, but that is ascribed to them and they sort of still inherit those um, identities from their parents that when people ask them, oh, where are you from? It's like, oh, I'm from the East, but it's immediately um, affiliated with sort of the rise of the AFD um, and immediately you are questioning yourself and I think a lot of people sort of question their own identity because if you're constantly still yeah, attributed to those, um, yeah, to like an identity that you can't choose yourself. I think that's really influential and I think that will take a long time um, still to sort of where we are at the point where you can fully choose who you are. Thank you. I think um, this already brings us uh, maybe to the to the next round of, of discussion on, on the successes of uh, German reunification and EU enlargement and, and the way how we can transport them, whose job is it? Um, and you already, uh, we already mentioned uh, dialogue, social dialogues in families, but maybe also what's the role of, of politics, uh, what's the role of, uh, of the media or civil society organization and what kind of aspects about um, um, reunification should, uh, should be more discussed or high Highlighted. I think maybe if you start from your um, point of view, just one second, I was also would also like to turn to the audience at this point and invite you to um, ask your questions to the panelists or, or to the round, uh, writing in the chat or raising your hand. We can see you and then, um, yeah, already the uh, join if you want to. And Maybe, Marie, you can start us off with like what's, um, what are the successes that we should highlight more in discussion and what are the ways to, to do that? Well, I think the biggest success is that Europe really came together and that without this unification, we could not have found a European voice. And I think if we look at it in a more global perspective, which we can now, um, otherwise... I don't think anyone would really listen to us if we would not have a European Union where we can express our thoughts and our common values. Um, that sort of goes uh, to foreign policy if we think about more global issues and climate change. Um, I think if we would not be united, we could not address those challenges. So I think that's one of the biggest benefits. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to add? Well, uh, without any doubts, the reunification of Germany was important symbolic step. But the symbolic steps are always important, uh, uh, like the, the pre-stages before uh, the next more formal steps are, are done. And the symbolics was, of course, in the fact that uh, division of Germany, and in particular the division of Berlin, even more highlighted by the erection of the Berlin Wall in 1961, was the main symbolism of uh, divided Europe, the main symbolism of this Iron Curtain, 
and all these metaphors that we are using, they usually uh, use this uh, symbolism in a, in, a, a, in a form of Berlin Wall, in a form of divided Ber uh, Berlin, divided Germany. So the reunification was a symbolic end of the, let's say, old era or the Cold War, despite it was one year already after 1989, but this symbolic step, like that the Germany is reuniting, Berlin is reuniting, so the next comes the other regions in Europe reuniting. Ironically, Czechoslovakia at that time was splitting. So we are talking about, we are here in, in Germany discussing the German reunification, but in the same time as it was happening here in, in, in Germany, the processes in my own country were uh, completely diverse, but it also needs to be mentioned that there was a different conditions. Uh, we have one nation divided into two states in case of Germany, but one state formed by two nations in case of Czechoslovakia. So, but it's still uh, in Czechoslovakia, anyone who was critical towards the split of, split of our common country was always pointing, why the hell are we doing this when the rest of the Europe is uniting? And at the same time, we take like the, the, the reverse track. Luckily, we reunited later in European Union, even without Slovakian former Slovakian brother. So eventually it turned out to be to be a successful end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think it's an important point that um, 1989 um, makes us uh, developing a European identity. So I, I had not before. And I, went, I had to go, as I mentioned before, I had to go to New York to have this uh, European unification party in 2004 to see that my uh, European identity is stronger than my East German identity in uh, 15 years after the war came down. It was really like a flashlight because there have been, on this party, there have been people from all over Europe and they all have been happy uh, that Europe get, getting more, uh, sep more bigger now and um, more diverse. And um, it was, really nice to to feel from abroad mm -hmm. that we have a cultural identity what goes back to history and f more far than to the uh, second world war more far in peaceful times too and uh, to enjoy the specialities of uh, european regions and to feel together and it was the same with having this uh, euro <laughs> in, the, in the hand first times as, as a political scientist i thought okay that's the symbol of market and oppression of these who are not part of the uh, uh, money uh, confederation and i then i had it in my hand and said okay it feels like that was the second, nay, the third um, money I had in my hand, German, East German uh, aluminium mark <laughs> and uh, West German D-mark, very powerful, and then this euro. Mm -hmm. And that was a development of uh, feeling and of identity. And I think that's important mm -hmm. to, uh, to build up a, a global identity too and to have uh, an idea of humankind. So it was nice. Maybe, um, as I said earlier, you're also part of the uh, committee that uh, the federal committee that celebrate um, or discussed about the celebration of 30 years um, 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 after reunification. And maybe you can outline some of the recommendations because there were also recommendations given. Um, outline some of the yeah, recommendations that were made. Yes, we made some recommendations on uh, especially uh, German themes, um, especially on to being true about that it's different being an East German and a West German for several reasons, for social reasons, for uh, career reasons, for um, maybe having chances in the German society to uh, blur up, you know. But on the other hand, we made an advice to, um, to have an European uh, transformation center and European Play in place with a European view what happens uh, to the last uh, 30 years and what should have to the future in the next 30 years, what means um, uh, to view on the political aspect, on the aspect of memories and on the cultural aspect and especially to, to have an, to integrate arts in all this thinking to 
to uh, have a communication with all people in the world because arts goes to the heart and not to the mind. So you don't need the language. You just need your mind to mm. feel what it means uh, to live in transition and or in transformation. And you, as you said, we have such a big global um, our questions to solve and uh, we need all people for that mm -hmm. not only our own view we no, no, no need a brighter view on it right thank you uh, there's one question in the chat um, that i would like to include um victoria meissner asks uh, to all panelists how should research institutes think tanks or reaches institute or think tanks try to communicate the success story of eu enlargement broadly who should be the main target group to achieve more unity in the EU and strengthen EU values and identity? So maybe, um, maybe Ishvan, you, uh, you also <laughs> are um, head of a research institute and a think tank. Uh, maybe you can share some of your approaches. Well, I think that we should communicate with, with everybody, actually, because there is a sort of crisis in public relations and communication. Many use the words that the European Union has a sort of democratic deficit, but I think it's more a sort of communication deficit that people uh, do not know these stories we are talking about, especially younger people, or people, as you mentioned, already have a different memory compared to their old memories 20 years ago. So they rewrite their stories, simplify their memories. They uh, start to think in political categories, uh, like in our countries where one side of the political spectrum seems to be the communist, the other side is the illiberal and very right-wing uh, other group. And the so-called communist and so-called right-wingers cannot talk to each other anymore, but both of them would like to monopolize uh, and manipulate in a way the past. So what I think research institutes, think tanks, NGOs might do to, to show a more complex picture and maybe a more realistic, not propagandistic picture of, of the past and to talk about the present in a in an open way. When, when you mentioned uh, that it was not only a success story what happened after 1989, for example, Czechoslovakia broke up, we should also mention the bloody wars on, on the Balkans, which were even more uh, terrible stories uh, or happenings in, in a broader sense, in a success, success story inside. So we, we should discuss why it happened, how it happened, and, and finally we should also mention that now we have at least uh, two countries coming from the former Yugoslavia, Croatia and Slovenia, which are member states of the European Union. So how the EU actually helped those countries to become uh, members of the democratic uh, community. And I think as for Germany, what we might communicate more often, it's, it's another success story that a united Germany, which is still so democratic that you can choose uh, between many op options inside the democratic camp. You don't have to choose like in Hungary for the one, one party, which, which is Orban's party, if you are an illiberal or authoritarian type person, or whatever reasons you support the current government, or you choose a non-Orban, someone or a party or a united opposition, which tries to bring back Hungary to the European track. But you have more options. It's a wonderful feeling when you can choose between, between Democrats, and you don't only have to vote against something, but you have a real option. So I think this should be also mentioned that it's very important to have a real pluralism and the European Union as a complicated institutional setup with its, with its multi-level decision-making uh, processes actually gives us hope that this, uh, that all the uh, benefits and merits of liberal democracies might survive. Even in my country, I think, or in Poland, uh, history matters a lot, I agree. But we have to be careful not to think in, in de deterministic categories. Uh, there are ups and downs, there are counter waves of uh, uh, illiberal or anti-democratic uh, thoughts uh, which are present uh, 
in our societies, and the representatives of these thoughts, often political entrepreneurs who use this, misuse these ideas, uh, might sometimes even get to power, like it happened in Poland and Hungary. But it doesn't mean that they will remain in power forever. And I think it's important for the, those countries, member states, European institutions, to emphasize the common European values, which we all must insist on in order to avoid the spreading of this illiberal populist virus all over in Europe. So my message would be that maybe it's given, maybe younger generations do not remember exactly what happened 30 years ago, but they should know that what they enjoy as given, as natural, uh, inside their democratic societies are, are not always there, and there are others who might threaten these uh, liberal conditions, and they might think about it, how to cope, how to be, get involved in political processes, and how to fight for these uh, values in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Especially on the point that uh, the uh, UK left the European Union, it was really like shocking for me. I was so sad, and I was not, I could not understand why the uh, people, the half of the people of uh, uh, of Britain, have really not said leaving us because they could be part of the party, you know, or part of the community. And it was, uh, I think, the research or science could look at it. How could that happen? That the uh, the land where democracy was born uh, thought they have to leave us, you know, to, to, to leave the family for, for what reason and for, for what option or for what future they want to leave a um, community like the European Union in. and uh, to look at it and to maybe in the soci sociology uh, or in um, political science or maybe in cultural science or whatever, what 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 happened in this country that they decided like this? And uh, it was really sad for me. I don't know how you felt, but I was really like shocked. And uh, um, yeah, it's an um, interesting part of, uh, of science to, to see what happened and to maybe to document what happened and we can learn for the next one who maybe think about <laughs> leaving us. So but which arguments we can find to help them maybe. Do you want to add? <laughs> Um, maybe we could. Uh, maybe it helps if we if we look at the meaning of self determination. Yeah, when when we try to memorize 89, 1990, one of the moments which linked all the movements was the drive for self determination. Okay, but self determination can mean different things. It can be individual, it can be community oriented, it can be self-determination within democracy vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis, um, autocracy, but it can also mean national self-determination vis-a-vis -vis transnational uh, self-determination. And, you know, I sometimes have the impression that these pro-integration and pro-EU circles and research institutes and study programs over-focus on the individual um, and transnational forms of self-determination and do not value enough national the national potential of self-determination. Not that I'm person personally a nationalist, but if we look at the referenda, for example, of European uh, accession, um, they, were, they are seen as a big success. But you could also look from, from the other perspective. I think there was in all East European, Central European countries, there was a minimum of 20% and sometimes many more people who did not want to join. Yeah, so so uh, understanding Europe and European politics about these minorities is something we uh, we should avoid. Yeah, there should be more research in a way which is not denouncing uh, populism right away or liberalism. There is this communitarian or republican idea of self determination. Um, and I, when I, I watched the, 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 the video, the movie, um, um, I wrote down s s different metaphors. Yeah, it's an autumn of peoples, it's a fall of miracles, it's a peaceful revolution. And if you look at the autumn of peoples, it's mean also that it's 
national communities somehow standing up against the Soviet Union, potentially against Germany as well. Yeah, so, so there is this element of national competition, so to say, and um, I have the feeling that what is happening today in the European Union does not pay attention to this to this competing image, yeah, which does not need to be automatically anti-European, but is embedded in the symbolism of 1989, which is autumn of people. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is some kind of patriotism which went, which was certainly relevant in Poland. Yeah, not not in East Germany too much because well, Germans and nationalism and patriotism it's it's a complicated story as all people who who you know who lived in the east of Germany and also in the west by the way um, uh, had to experience uh, some seventy years ago. But there was this national, I mean, think of the Baltic states, for example. It was in a way purely national, almost nationalistic uh, um, um, revolutions within the Soviet Union. Think about Ukraine, think about Georgia. I mean, you know, think about Yugoslavia, which was also a, a, a history of, of national feelings against each other. And uh, just the fact that these national feelings have turned against each other at a certain time should not prevent us of, of acknowledging that there is this republican way of thinking about Europe and this liberal way of thinking about Europe. Yeah, and it's, I think it's no coincidence that Orban constantly speaks of illiberal democracy. This is, for, from his per perspective, this is not even bad. You know, it, it's, it's a marker to, to for a different type of democracy. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you as a Hungarian have, have different things to say because I would not like I would not know what I would do if I lived in a country like Hungary at the moment when these illiberal elites somehow gain momentum and, and try to dominate all the rest of society. But there is this contradiction. Maybe it's um and the, the challenge is to figure out uh, what's the, um, the self-determination aspect and do not conflate this always with uh, that's in itself European value that needs uh, to, to automatically, automatically be integration, but also mm. to define European values as um, democracy um, or, or to define it in with more than just, uh, you know, you're either pro-European or you're not. It's and certainly not helpful to, to speak of European values, yeah, um, yeah. because, um, I mean, it's one of the narratives of, of peace and, and fetus. They, we, they say we stand for the real Europe, you know. So, I, I mean, who could who mm. could say which which image of Europe now is is correct? You know, it has become almost like a, like a, like a weapon, like a rhetorical weapon to speak of different images of Europe, and um, we as scholars have to see that that people mean different things when they mm. speak about Europe. You know, it's not it's not this, it's not all the same. Um, I is it directly connected? Yeah, then, then I have, there's a question in the audience, but then yeah, you yeah. can go. Uh, well, I think that uh, if, if the democratic parties, the liberal-minded parties and intellectuals can use a language where you can combine both European and national, in our case Hungarian, national sentiments and values and identities, that might be a way out from, from that dilemma. And uh, certainly left-wing parties and often liberals, centrist parties, have a problem sometimes how to use and how to play with uh, or cope with uh, uh, national sentiments. But I think it's, it's possible to talk about both European and uh, national identities uh, in a public debates and then political debates when you fight against uh, the representatives of illiberal democracies. Actually, in the rhetoric of uh, our current government, Brussels is an ugly word. It's not a sort of, uh, you know, compromising uh, rhetoric. It's very hard anti-European uh, or Eurosceptic uh, language. It's true that they, they say we are the real Europeans, but it's, uh, it's clear that it means something which has nothing to do with the current European mm. Union, whether 
they would build something which is based on independent nation states who still cooperate some way, we don't know. But what uh, liberals and, uh, and pro-EU uh, uh, analysts and, and political players should emphasize that this is real a dangerous process. And you can see it in, in Hungary and in Poland, what happened to, the, to our democratic liberal regimes and how major uh, values, major uh, benefits of liberal democracy have been uh, deconstructed and undermined. Uh, that can be seen by all sort of reports by whatever independent organizations and the European Parliament as well. So maybe the, 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 the fight or the cleavage between uh, the, the one side, the populists and illiberals and the uh, Democrats and liberals uh, is not only about Europe, but it, they both they have a bigger package and we should talk about everything and then it will be clear that even if they say that we want to reform the we want to reform Europe, not the EU actually, what they talk about. And when they speak uh, a language saying, we represent Central Europe, I represent Hungary, that's what Viktor Orban is saying. If you attack me, you attack Hungary. This is certainly not acceptable for anyone who doesn't support Orban or the government. So this is a majoritarian idea about democracy and liberals should unmask the idea of majoritarianism which doesn't accept any outgroups, these distant voices in public debates, how dangerous it is for the younger generation and for everybody. I think it's not a hopeless fight when we are courageous enough to use this language which is about everything, including national identity. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to include uh, Katrin Böttke in the discussion. She already has a microphone. I have a microphone. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very the, for the very interesting discussion. Um, I wanted to ask, um, actually I have for, uh, for um, uh, in terms of having equal rights, I have a question for each of you. Um, but first, also for the sake of the discussion, I would like to slightly disagree with you, Tim, uh, on the term that there was no nationalistic part of the movement in German uh, reunification. Because I think when you look at the uh, Monday demonstrations in Leipzig, there was an element. I, it certainly was not the, the main narrative of the process but there was also some groups that were uh, proposing a more nationalistic view on, on reunification and I think that's also the reason why, why they have usurped the Monday demonstrations <laughs> afterwards as well. But um, I really like your concept of um, self-determination and I was wondering whether you think that the environmental movements in, in East Germany also played an important role in, in, the, uh, in the fall of the wall ultimately because I think this might also be an element um, of uh, you know, feeling that there was environmental damage done and this also ties into the climate change issues that you mentioned as well. Um, the, the question for you, uh, I have for you, Judith Enders, is um, the third generation East is at the age to have children, I would say. So I wanted to ask you the question, um, um, in how far to re or how you um, if you discuss the question of how to relate the fall of the wall to this fourth generation, let's say, um, is that an issue that you discuss or that you make events on as well? And Ishwan, I wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned that you know the illiberal democracy is just a hopefully just a phase. Do you think that Hungary is still democratic enough for an election to produce a different result than Orban being re-elected, or do you think that? the structural changes that have been made uh, can already prevent that from happening today. Um, Petra, I wanted to ask you what, you what do you think the role of the privatization played in the whole process um, and uh, maybe also in the fact that the transformation process was sometimes seen as incomplete. Do you think that some of the choices that were made in terms of privatization maybe could have been improved uh, in order to take the citizens along, I think. And, um, and finally, Marie, I wanted to ask you also, um, what would be your reaction to the criticism that uh, Petra also mentioned that there was actually no, that some people say that there was no actual re regime change and it was just, you know, new faces, new elites that were brought on, but the system didn't really change. Um, and there, uh, there was no real improvement for people's individual lives. Would you, what would be your kind of feeling or reaction to this? So thank you very much. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, then maybe we go in the direction of uh, the ads. So you start with the environmental en impact. Environmental groups and the impact. I'm, I'm not a real expert, but I'm skeptic. Yeah, I'm skeptic. I think it 
in, in since since the eighties, the SED regime was simply discredited in the view of of the vast majority of the population, and environmental policy was certainly you know one element, but you could name many other elements um, as well, and also. If I remember well, uh, the ecological parties did not even make it into the first uh, first uh, Bundestag and the first uh, Bundestag after reunification. This could also be an indicator against the idea that environment played played such a big role. I mean, even until today, teaching uh, in Frankfurt an der Oder um, and having a link to to um, areas both north and south of Frankfurt under order, um, people are quite ambivalent about coal. For example, yeah, they um, the the very path of um, East European and uh, East German industrial policy was to was to heavily regionalize uh, um, their industries, and so the, it's whole regions in the in the Lausitz, for example, which depend on coal and steel until until. Today Today. And they are relatively skeptic towards an over, you know, a, a, about a fast, um, a fast speed in, in climate policy. So I'm skeptic. Thank you. Yes, um, but uh, maybe <coughs> add something to mm -hmm. the idea of the environmental movement in the East. I think that was. Uh, part of the peace and environmental movement of the 70s and 80s and such movement was a kind of global thing and uh, you think of the uh, UN conference in 1992 where the climate uh, uh, protection uh, and uh, biodiversity protection and uh, Agenda 21 was uh, Put put on on the scene of the global um, politics, and um, and the other hand was that if you wanted to do anything, what was opposite in the former GDR, it was it was clever to find yourself under the umbrella or under the roof of the church, and the church, uh, the Christian church, had uh, the idea of uh, the connecting of environment and uh, development, and so that was a kind of zeitgeist uh, uh, where you can find yourself if you wanted to change the world or change your country. So I think there is a connection of, um, of the uh, 68 movement and the environmental and development movement of the 80s. And um, more, more bec becoming than a sustainability movement. And um, what about the fourth generation? Yes, um, I was really like uh, moved uh, during the last five years that a lot of young people in the in their twenties now uh, have been born in 1989 after the war came down, and they. But there have been some in Germany who uh, explored or exp uh, uh, wrote about their experiences uh, having parents uh, who have been East Germans and grown up somewhere not in the East, somewhere, in the West, somewhere, but there is a transgenerational aspect of uh, of the East uh, German identity. And I was kind of shocked because I thought we are the third generation, we are the last ones who have to deal with all these uh, circumstances, with these experiences, with thinking about identity and thinking about in what, what kind of a society I want to live and where can I integrate my idea of life or where not. But uh, I figured out, or we figured out, that uh, the next generation have these questions too. They ask in, a, in another way that I really, uh, pro, um, I really, uh, really like it that they ask in another way. And I have uh, children by myself, and sure, uh, I have one of the children, uh, West and East children, <laughs> and um, it's, it's a question in every family. I think uh, who have. Uh, connections to the in, in family to the former uh, GDR territory or to the former East European territory to ask uh, where my family come from and how ca how we unite or not unite uh, in um, 
in the way of having this iron curtain through the world, you know. And uh, I think there is a fourth generation and they have other other ways of asking what happened and asking what, what, what does it make with my own life. And yeah, we'll see if there is a fifth generation or not. I don't know. It, sometimes I, say, I think um, to repeat always the East-West discourse is a kind of manifestation of separation and manifestation of... Uh, a kind of imbalanced, um, imbalanced uh, chances in the world, and other side, it's not very good to put it under the under the carpet. So, yes, it's a question of balancing, not forgetting, but not always uh, repeating the uh, the old uh, prejudice. That's hard to think about it. Maybe um, Marie Kepler, you can um, make and share from from your own experience. In you know, how was it in in your family? How got you? How did you get interested in the topic? Uh, and when was the first time that you uh, you know was conf were confronted um, uh, with East West uh, difference um, or or the, the um, yeah the history? And maybe also how you would wish to talk about it um, as a direct answer, and then also comment. Uh, um, On, on the question by Katrin. <laughs> um, well, yes, both of my parents are actually from the West, so I don't know if those family, um, yeah, not to say problems, but like um, it's very much a Western identity in my family. So I first learned about it um, because my mum's best friend, she um, lived in Berlin. Uh, so when we would go to city trips, we sort of learned about it and then only really started to engage with it during school um, and sort of education as well. Um, but I think that's quite sad because we don't have those um, emotional values that are attached to it. And as people get older and one day, yeah, like people that lived in those times cannot share their stories anymore. Um, I think it must, um, there must be like an emotional way to access, access the time and to learn about it more. Um, And I think actually to do that in a trans-European way that we learn together as sort of like a European youth would be a great way to do that, um, whether that's sort of through exchanges or like maybe have like panel discussions like this, but only with young people um, to discuss the future. Um, that would be a way to really yeah connect your emotions with it um, because as we heard a lot, today that it's, it's a, more about the hearts rather than the minds that are connected to Europe. And then relating back to your question, um, well definitely sort of um, the, whether there was real re regime change that definitely varies. Um, and I think young people still feel that today. I think we all still have very different identities. My identity as a European citizen might be different to, um, and I, a similar person in Hungary, sort of of the, of the similar age. Um, but I think there really was um, what really changed that or affects that is social media because we are so interconnected that it sort of national, I don't want to speak for a lot of people, but for me, national identity does not really matter anymore. Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind as we sort of move away from what, is an identity more to what do we care about? Um, and that I think has a lot more to do with global issues like climate change and global peace, um, that those are more um, the issues that we care about rather than um, who we are as a national identity. Maybe I can add yeah. something what I forgot about very shortly. Uh, we really uh, think about what what to, can we give to the next generation and uh, um, how can we keep uh, the memories uh, alive. And uh, we um, we establish with our association a learning portal where you can uh, uh, book as a history teacher. You can can book a Zeitzeuge or a witness and uh, from our age, and uh, people come and tell their stories. How 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 was it as a schoolmate in the East or after in the transition uh, times and uh, that's our idea of making it easier for the teachers 
to go on the theme, what is uh, no, not every teacher likes to talk about transformation processes. He's in Germany because it's a hot thing, uh, not to say the bad thing or a false thing or whatever. And so we have this portal uh, where the teachers can find somebody who tells from uh, from real uh, experiences uh, to the pupil now in school, maybe 10th grade or something in history lessons. Uh, what does it mean and uh, how was it? And so some say, sometimes the pupils themselves talk to their family at home and so the family stories go on and go on and get, that did not get lost. So that's what we offer to the mm -hmm. next generation. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, maybe Ishvan, um, the question was about the phase. Is that just a phase? Um, illiberal democracies, the, if that was correctly summarized. <laughs> Especially the, the, cho the chances of the opposition of in the next election, if I'm correct. Uh, I would like to start with the, com with the idea that it's important that the, the politicians in, uh, in the other member states you know, or representatives of the European Union should speak up, should use their voice and make it clear that uh, what happens in Hungary and in Poland is not acceptable. And uh, it's not any, you know, sort of uh, uh, intervention into Hungarian uh, internal affairs anymore. We are in the European Union. And it would be a misunderstanding to say that if, uh, I don't know, the next uh, Chancellor of Germany would have a critical remark about uh, Orban, it would help Orban and not the opposition, that just the other way around. It would show it even more uh, clear way to the Hungarian population that uh, uh, how much uh, or the Orban regime has been isolated inside the European Union. Actually, even today, most of the Hungarians are pro-EU, so a big majority. You're right, Timo, that uh, there are others who who might not agree or might have some suspicions or skepticism about Brussels, but the huge majority still supports the idea to, to remain a member state, maybe because of more utilitarian arguments. For some others, symbolic idealism is also important, that we are a democratic community. But for whatever reasons, the majority still supports EU membership. And if it becomes evident that uh, that a sort of Hungarian exit is in in is one scenario at least in Orbán's mind, people might uh, decide to vote against this scenario. So it would help, I think. Now, it's also true that the the uh, competition is not fair. There is an uneven field, and the race is, you know, beneficial for for Orbán since he changed the rules, and uh, uh, there is a huge. Uh, advantage on his side regarding media or financial resources uh, and many people especially in in uh, in the rural areas only watch traditional TVs where you have a sort of propaganda machinery of the government today which doesn't speak about facts only using a language which is totally illiberal and sometimes quite extremist actually but in spite of that, I think that uh, at least 50% of the population still supports or would support an alternative. So we are at 50-50 at the moment. And the opposition has been more or less united quite recently. There is a new Elan in Hungary with a new prime minister candidate who is a little bit more conservative than usually the opposition leaders. And it might help, you know, to convince and seduce some people from the other side or so-called uncertain uh, citizens who don't know whom to vote for. So the chances are not so bad, but it's true that in spite of 50% plus one, probably the opposition would need 53, 54% before because of the gerrymandering and the electoral uh, uh, mechanisms what Orban and his party introduced uh, in the parliament. But there is a hope. We cannot say that uh, uh, because of the, all the tricks uh, Orban has introduced, the, the competition is over and uh, the opposition should give it up. Not at all. There is a political momentum, maybe, and, uh, and next year, April next year, it might happen. It, 
maybe I'm too optimistic, maybe not, but I think in politics, as when we talk about 1989, we should remember that things might change uh, in a very rapid way, and uh, the mood has changed, and uh, Orban might make mistakes, the opposition might have good luck, so we don't know what will happen in the next following month, and, uh, and we should look at the process uh, with, an, with an optimistic uh, manner. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, we haven't really talked about um, uh, economic uh, transformation a lot uh, in this round today, but um, maybe you can, Petter, you can... Uh, uh, thank you. The question was about the role of privatization. In general, if 1990, the first post-communist elections, were mainly about political transformation, then the second, 1992, were mainly about economic transformation. And definitely the privatization, the process of privatization, which at that moment was already partially under its way, but the main stages were still ahead. So these privatization processes were uh, the key reforms within the uh, economic transition. And especially when we talk about the new, newly emerging political party led by Václav Klaus, the more technocratic uh, politician, more technocratic than Václav Havel, who was more like a idealistic and more humanist. And Václav Klaus and his uh, Civic Democratic Party had the economic transition, including the privatization process, as their flagship. And when we were discussing about uh, the presence of some nationalistic features in our transitional processes, I can say that the, this nationalistic feature was present in the privatization processes in the Czech Republic at that time. And I can show you, uh, I, I can prove this on one example. There were many uh, very controversial privatization decisions made, uh, and these decisions uh, were usually privatizing, privatizing uh, these uh, state-owned or previously state-owned companies into the hands of uh, a newborn Czech economic sharks, the business sharks, the business allies. But many of these decisions were controversial. Many of these um, Czech uh, fastly self-made uh, businessmen, they collapsed soon, and uh, suddenly it seemed that this, uh, uh, and at the same time, this Czech way of privatization, or privatization in Czech, Czech hands, was still kind of justified that we have to keep uh, the, the national treasure in the Czech hands. And on the other hand, you had a decision to privatized, and it was a decision of the government not led by Václav Klaus yet, it was a decision of his predecessor, Petr Pidhart, who was the prime minister between 1990 to 1992, and his government made a privatization decision which was very much criticized. They were called traitors. They were called that they betrayed Czech Republic. They, all, they were called that they should almost be punished for doing this, and that was privatization of Škoda Auto into the hands of Volkswagen. Like many people, I was talking about these grievances, historical grievances. The sensitiveness of Czech-German relations were still in a, in a large portion of Czech society uh, reviving these uh, past grievances. And they say, how could you? How could you privatize the Czech treasure the, from late, late uh, 19th century when the Škoda, the predecessor of Škoda, was founded, how could you give it to the hands of Germans? Eventually, it turned out to be the best privatization decision at all. And the politicians that made the decision in 1990, 1991, today, when they remember, like, they were almost attacked on the streets. Like, the people almost, like, were calling for some kind of lynching them. And now they say, you see, this is probably the most profitable uh, company that was the result of privatization processes, and where are all these uh, privatizations that were made in the Czech hands, where, which were promoted mainly by Václav Klaus and, the, uh, and, and his governments? They, in many cases, they failed. They, they uh, dismantled, they changed uh, owners several times because they were not uh, privatized into the uh, stable hands, they were privatized into the hands of people who were 
as I said already before, self-made business sharks, and they had not much, or we don't know if they had, but eventually it turned out that they did probably not have much, much uh, a strategy and knowledge how to keep a long-term, uh, long-term profitable uh, or the prof company is profitable for a long term. They usually just collected the profits from the short term, and eventually some e some of them even fled to uh, exile to outside, and th they left companies uh, on their own fate. So nationalism was definitely present in the processes of privatization and we see from the perspective from from the perspective of 30 years after that uh, many of uh, the decisions privatization decisions uh, are still hidden uh, under some uh, i don't want to say a secret uh, or, or the decisions made made secretly uh, not all the information were disclosed yet so we don't know what is still held behind and who influenced, who else influenced the privatization decisions. And of course, uh, all, the, uh, all the suspicious that there might be also some bribery and covered as the financial sponsorship of the political parties. Coincidentally, the parties that were at power and that were deciding about, about the privatization. So it's, it's still an open issue, although it's 30 years ago and uh, there is still a lot of uh, we haven't learned yet about the details of many operations that led to privatization. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, since we're um, already nearing the end of our discussion, I would like nonetheless to make a very short um, last round and um, would like to reiterate the question um, that I posed at the beginning. Does the peaceful revolution of 1989, do they serve as a focus point for European, for European memory, European heritage? Um, with a, it's a loaded big question, but um, maybe what, um, you know, a, quick answer, does it serve us, uh, and in what way or why not? We start maybe yeah, with you. Um, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm right. Yeah, I, I, I tell you what I think about this. Um, I, I tr like to make the division of framing democracy either in liberal terms or in republican terms. And if a large majority of society is ready to frame democracy in liberal terms. It means that the memory of 1989 is much about freedom, is much about individual self-determination, not minding if a national company is sold out to some other, you know, <laughs> owners from, from other countries. In short, it's compatible with the way the European Union works. However, if you have societies where this more Republican image uh, of self-determination prevails. Um, the memory of 1989 is ambivalent because on the one hand, freedom you know, has been gained, uh, a autocratic power has been reversed. This is a pro, but the part of the um, revolution which was patriotic is not that compatible with an EU in which majoritarian decisions are even a provocation. Yeah? I'm not saying the one or the other is better. I just I'm, I, I like to, to see it in terms of being more compatible or less compatible. And this is why, for example, the some kind of Baltic nationalism is more compatible with, uh, with uh, the European Union than is the case in the especially conservative parts of Hungary, Hungarian and, uh, and Polish society, which have a problem with uh, transnationalism, which have a problem with, with uh, ways of leading lives which are somehow alien to, um, to traditional family values and so on. And so there is a com constant ambivalence in the, in the politics of these, uh, of these elites and of these um, intellectuals also with the way the European, Un European Union works. A solution I don't have, yeah? I, I, but you know. I think it's a very, um, um, very interesting differentiation also to make, um, also when conceptualizing um, um, 
education or, 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 or videos like this, for instance. Mm. Um, you did end up. Yeah, for me, the most important <coughs> learnings from 98, um, 1989 is um, it's possible to have a revolution without violence, mm -hmm. especially in the German way. The others are some, some are different, like Romania or whatever. But um, I'm with Markus Meckel in the, in the film. He said, uh, change is possible, and I would say, change is necessary. So Europe have to develop and have to find new ideas, new idea of a global identity maybe, and connection to the others, to China, to the US, to South America, and to Africa especially. And for me, it's important that change can be without violence. And that's uh, the thing what we can learn mm -hmm. and uh, what everybody should know. Uh, that it's not necessary to kill each other to change the society. So <laughs> there is hope and <laughs> there should be peace. And uh, especially if we have this um, uh, things like to think about climate change, to think about biodiversity loss, to think about uh, water, whatever, we have conflicts, a lot of conflict, global conflicts coming up. Mm -hmm. And so we, as, a, as Europeans and as a European Union and as uh, as people who uh, figured out that revolution can be without blood, uh, should think on this experience to develop the future and to ve develop in a future way to be um, a part of the uh, of the global who is peaceful. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I think that uh, 1989 should have a place in our historic memories, uh, and it should have a very important and the symbolic role, just like uh, almost, or maybe even so like 1789. And I think we all know what happened after 1789, whether we talk about the Jacobins or Napoleon and so on. That's another story. And now we have a sort of joint uh, interpretation of the ideas of uh, 1789, the French Revolution. And I think in 1989, what happened, that was the end of the Cold War after a warm war, the Second World War. And uh, that's very important that we don't have this uh, terrible competition between two political regimes. One of them is a more or less totalitarian one, the mm -hmm. communist part of that world. And, uh, and if we say, 1989 is actually from 1988 to 1991, then the collapse of the Soviet Union belongs to that story, which was the, really the end of the, the uh, Cold War. So these were historic moments and events, and we should not ignore them. And what happened then, it's, it's a very great debate how to interpret the next, uh, the forthcoming uh, following 30 years, and that's very important to, to discuss them. I want to emphasize one thing, what what we already discussed, that's the United Germany. The United Germany is also the outcome of 1989. And we can celebrate it, as I try to say, that we have a United Germany which plays such an important role inside the European Union and hopefully to keep the EU together in, in its um, shared values. Germany plays and maybe plays an important role and maybe should play an even more important role as many member states, politicians, political parties would like to have a Germany which often leads the European Union. We haven't discussed it, but I think it would be important to, to, to emphasize the role of Germany, the biggest member states, uh, say the most wealthiest member state for the future, which should be a guarantee of a liberal and republican European <laughs> Union. All right. Thank you. Peter. The legacy of 1989, if it should be uh, expressed in one word, is usually the freedom. And this leads to a situation that the changes that happened in 1989 that uh, opened the space for discussion, uh, freedom for speech, freedom of speech, freedom of discussion, freedom of political thought, that is something that also the old forces that were ousted out of the power should be somehow grateful for. because. Now we have a group, like after every change of the regime, we have always a group of people who represent the old regime and who feel that they lost the transition. Uh, 
that unlike during their times when they were at power, now the current regime gives them opportunity to express their thoughts. So I always say, when I, when I listen to, let's say, politicians from the Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia criticizing today's regime, today's state of democracy, I always say, well, the fact that you can criticize the state of democracy, the fact that you can freely attack today's political allies, ruling political allies, and you are not arrested, you are not sent into coal mines, you are not sent to prison, you are not sent to execution, that is something you should be grateful for as well. I don't think these people realize that enough, uh, that they are critical and they have a right to be critical, but they should focus on, or they should remember what they did when they were at power to the same groups that were at that time critical mm -hmm. to their state, their regime, their governance. Thank you for this point. And last but not least, again, the youngest of our room, <laughs> uh, group, round, <laughs> Marie Kepler. Um, well, I think what's definitely the most important aspect is that the discussion and the memories kept alive, that we keep talking about it and through many different ways keep yeah, keep the memory alive and keep the youth engaging with it. Um, but I think the most, um, perhaps, yeah, most important value that we can take from the time is the hope that people had. And I think that that is something that applies, especially to the future that we, yeah, sort of go back and remember that this hope was there and that we need that hope for, for future issues. Thank you very much. And with this hopeful uh, end, I would also like to end um, our event today. I thank all of the panelists very much for your uh, contributions and for the discussion, for the questions from the audience, um, also the one here and the one at home. Um, I want to thank all my colleagues at IEP for organizing this event with me. And I would like to uh, already announce uh, that on the 8th of November, there will be the follow-up event to this one from our partners in, in Prague at the Metropolitan University in Prague. So check out their website for the invitations and dates. And uh, we will continue the discussion here in Berlin as well at the 10th of November, already in two weeks, uh, when we uh, certainly will discuss some of the, some of the points made here um, in more detail and uh, look at uh, the effects um, of German reunification today uh, in a closer look. So you're very welcome to join us then again. And uh, with this, I wish you a nice evening and uh, hope you had an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.